The word mandala simply means circle, and although it has a great deal of religious and spiritual and cultural symbolism, it's also a beautiful art form. Creating a mandala-like design in polymer clay is a relaxing and meditative project with beautiful results. Hi there, Sandy here. Welcome to another polymer clay video at keepsakecrafts.net. The first thing you'll want to do before making your mandala is settle on a color scheme. I have a Pinterest board where I save color combinations that I like, that maybe are different, that inspire me, maybe ones I wouldn't have put together myself. I often refer to that board so that I don't always use the same colors because if you know me, you know I love the purple, blue, green, and those jewel tones, and I'd make everything in those. So sometimes I refer to that board to find different combinations like this gorgeous autumn scene. I just love the gradation from the green to the yellows to the red. So beautiful. But make sure when you look at something like this that you'll notice one of the things that makes that gradation so gorgeous are the other colors that you might not notice in the photo, like the deep blue and the little pops of light blue of the water. Once you have your colors decided on, you can start making blends. The first thing you want to do is make a blend and then roll it into a bullseye cane. If you don't know how to do this, there are tons of videos on the internet. I have a video on how to make a blend and how to roll it up like this. I used about a half a package each of three different colors. Primo Black, I'm not sure the name of this color because it's worn off my package. I think it's it's dark blue glitter, navy blue glitter, but it's a dark blue with glitter in it. And Sculpey Souffle in Robin's Egg. Once I made my bullseye cane, I left it fairly large so that I could use this as the background. I'll have those other autumn colors on top of it. It'll be a really nice background. Cut yourself a nice thick slice of that. And you know, even though I let this sit overnight, boy, it really did distort. So I'm gonna kinda get it back into round. I've got a piece of jelly paper here and I'm just going to use a roller to roll it out a bit. Since we're going to cut this into a pendant later, I do want it maybe a little bit bigger get that square shape. Funny, I let this sit overnight before slicing it and it just squashed right down to an oval <laughs> when I cut it in the slicer. So I, it's really quite distorted. So I'm going to roll this out. Let's see. Maybe, maybe just a tiny bit more this way. That'll be fine. A couple of helpful things you can do for yourself is make, is use a round cutter to make a mark. Now you can do this as many times as you want, make concentric rings, but keep in mind that you're going to want to cover them up with your slices later, so don't make too many or it'll seriously limit your choices. Just a very light mark to keep things round. Then I'm going to try to find my largest round cutter that will cut that out. I have this set here. I love all the size options. I'll have a link to this at the blog post. And I'm going to have to tilt this so that I can see it. In fact, I'm going to put this back where it was. That way I can make sure I have this perfectly centered looks pretty good. So now I have a nice round piece. This would be a great place to use a tool that will mark something in different segments. I'm going to mark mine in eighths because that's an easy one to eyeball. Barbara McGuire has a bunch of stamps that are radial marking tools and you can mark yours in sevenths or ninths or fifths or whatever suits, but I'm just going to do eight because that's, like I said, easy to eyeball. And I'm just using the blunt end of my blade and looking at it straight down. 
and then cutting, not cutting, just lightly marking. So whatever amount of spaces around you want, you just need to mark those. I think it would be fun to do it with seven or something, although an odd number does complicate design. So that's our background all ready to go. And here is the blend I created based on the colors in that photo. So here is the blend I created. Lots of vibrant colors here. Notice I didn't worry about mixing it entirely. There's no need to do that. The colors I used are wasabi, cadmium yellow, cadmium red, and I believe this is alizarin crimson. Again, another one. The labels worn off my package. They're all Primo colors. What we're going to do with this blend is extrude it into different shapes and then use these shapes to build a design, a mandala design, on top of our blue background piece. So you'll need to choose some dyes in a scale that works. Now if you just have like the walnut hollow extruder, it comes with a lot of dyes, but I happen to have several from Lucy Clay. And you could certainly get crazy. I think I may extrude some of these squares. But you could get crazy certainly and try building something with, oh, I don't know, like that or that's a little big. But So it depends on the scale you're working in. That would be a fun piece to play with. A heart, again, that's kind of big. That little star, whatever. Use your imagination. I just kind of went with basic shapes, a teardrop, a circle, a little marquee shape, a triangle, a diamond, and I think I'm going to throw in a square for this one. Choose somewhere around five or six dies. Next I'm going to prepare this to go into the extruder. Just going to cut it and stack it before rolling it into a log. I just think it's easier that way. I'm mostly keeping these aligned, but honestly, it's not a big deal. Now I'll just kind of squeeze that just so that it will fit into the barrel of your extruder. This is still a little big. I have the Lucy Clay, the check extruder, which is wonderful, but you don't have to have that. And like I said, even if you only have the set of dies that comes with a different extruder, you still could do this. Oh, and this blend, by the way, was made with about a half a package of each color. So I have a total here of about four ounces of clay. Oh, there we go. Very good. So that just about fills that extruder. Just pick one. It doesn't matter. Pick one to start with and then put it on. There we go started to come out. I really love the, the Lucy Clay extruder has a little table that holds this so I don't have to grip it with a death grip, which is what I'm doing now. <laughs> but you're going to extrude about six inches of each shape. Alright, that'll do. Got my six inches. Then you're just going to take the end off, take out that disc, and replace it with a different one and repeat, keep repeating until you have all of your clay extruded. So you, you could go back, like I've got green teardrops, but if I wanted to, I could start over again with another one. This will be plenty to work on our little mandala piece. And this is what I got out of that Skinner blend that I showed you. So I did teardrops, and then the squares, the diamond, circles, the little kind of flat oval, triangle, and then I had a little bit left, so I went back to the teardrop. So now it's time to cut these in slices, but first, once you've extruded your shapes, you really, really want to let them sit overnight so that they can rest before you cut them that way you will minimize distortion. Use whatever method you have for cutting. You can certainly just use a blade. So I'm just going to trim off all my ragged ends. 
That's not pretty. I just love those colors. You don't need to cut these particularly thin. Somewhere around a sixteenth of an inch, two millimeters. It's just best to have them be consistent in thickness. So you can use a blade like I'm doing here and then you end up with all of your little shapes. Because you let the clay rest overnight, they aren't all distorted. So we've got all these great shapes to build our mandala with. I've done my slicing and this is for the most part about two inches of each of these extrusions and I still have this left and I actually did another piece that I'll show you in a minute. Just that bit of clay will give you enough to make several mandalas. Now that we have our base and our pieces ready it, we can start building. I like having it on one of these little four inch tiles that way I could just pick it up and move it around. So I think I'll start at this green end and I think actually I'm going to put like a little dot in the middle. I think it will make it easier. I've done a couple of these already and the tricky part is getting the center, getting things to meet nicely in the center. So maybe if I put a dot in the middle, you know what? Instead of that, because I really like my blend, I'm going to grab one of these and roll a ball and put that in the middle. For these, I've just used my extruded slices, but you definitely could add in bits of clay like I'm doing here, little sort of clay embroidery things you can texture them. It doesn't all have to be flat. You can do as much as you want. As many different things as you want. This is just one of those things. It's so enjoyable to do. It's very much a meditative process. Oh, I think that's going to be much easier than the other ones. And as you go, you may find some of your slices are a little wonky or they might have something on them. Feel free to discard the ones that you don't like. You should have plenty. You can also flip it over. And I'm trying very hard to keep this as even as I can manage, especially in the center because any unevenness will only get multiplied the further out we go. If you have areas that you need to smooth out, one of these little silicone shapers is great. Also to nudge things into place, like right here I can see that this one is a little further over than it ought to be. That's a thin one. You kind of scoot it in from the outside if you need to fit a piece in rather than laying it down from the top. And I'll speed up this for you because while it's enjoyable to do it yourself, like I said, it's kind of a meditative process. I would imagine it could be kind of dull to watch somebody do an entire one. It doesn't take actually all that long really. I spent maybe half an hour each on the other two that I made. That's not perfectly even but it's not bad and I think that little dot in the middle definitely helped. So now what have we got? Let's see, I guess we have some squares. Maybe we'll do them like this. I'm conscious of needing to cover up that line and then you can kind of smooth it out with your shaper. If you're wondering what that piece of paper is under the tile, it just needs to be tilted the smallest amount so that you don't get glare in the camera. See, there it is. But just having that little bit of tilt, I've noticed, makes it a little easier to look at. A very light touch is called for here when you're doing this because these are clay and you can easily mash them up and totally ruin your shapes. So just the lightest of touches with your fingers, with the tools, because this, these are so small that any little marks that you make, little dents, are going to look huge on the small piece. 
And if you find pieces or you wreck pieces, which happens sometimes the way they stick together after being cut, just put them somewhere else so you don't mistakenly pick it up and keep picking up the same one over and over again and say, no, I don't want to use that one. If I wasn't doing it as an ombre blend, then you could just pick the shape that best suits the space you have. I kind of made it more difficult on myself. What else is new? Uh, in deciding that I wanted to keep the blend intact, that means I kind of have to make the shapes that I have got work. If you get your heart set on having a certain shape, you could just go extrude some more clay in the color that you want in that shape, but I'm really not interested in being that picky about it. I just will use what I've got. I like doing at some point, I've done it on all of the ones I've done so far, something like this where I get out to the outside and I use these pointy things, whatever they might be, teardrops or diamonds, to make something that's kind of like a flower bud with three pieces coming out from a single point. Keep in mind as you're doing this that we're going to be cutting this. I mean, you could certainly leave yours whole, but the design that I decided to do, I'm going to be cutting a portion of this to make a pendant. So you can, in the end, pick the section that you think looks nicest, that you like the best. We should always try to make it all look as good as we can, but you know, sometimes some parts just come out better than others. And like I said before, when you get to the outside, any unevenness uneven is kind of amplified. You're like, oh boy, I got a lot more space here than there. What happened? <laughs> but it's all good. When you're right on top of it, you notice these things and it's like glaring. But then when you back off, you just see the hole and it's like, wow, that looks awesome. Just enjoy the process and you will have something nice at the end. Also, if you have a few dents, like from fingernails, which I seem to keep doing, we will smooth out the top a bit. We're not going to smooth it down flat, but we will smooth it out a bit when we're done. So don't worry about that. This is what I have left for clay, these little bits, and all of this will probably enough for at least one or two more. Here are a couple others I made. Here's one I just made with a blend from my stash. I didn't even look to see if the colors would go. This is another one that I made using the same blend, only I started from the dark on the inside and went to the outside. The, what's interesting is this one has a lot more contrast because the light colors ended up on the dark and the darks on the lights, whereas this one I have the light green on the center light blue and then as the base gets darker, the colors get darker. I don't know which one I like better. I kind of love them both. Once you have it done, you can smooth it out a little bit. Just take a deli sheet, make sure it's clean spread that over and you can feel it's not entirely even and we'll just burnish this down this helps adhere those pieces in place and do it gently so you don't distort and also like I said earlier smooths out any nicks or anything and now we're ready to make our mandalas into pieces of jewelry once you have your mandalas done you can do whatever you like with them what I did with this one was I used a shape template to cut out a shape that I liked and then added a backing with a little bit of a border around it. And the next thing to do is to add a textured backing and decide if I'm going to make it into a pin or a pendant and add appropriate findings. What I have here are shape templates that I made. If you want to learn how to make your own shape templates, I did make a Friday Findings video on my YouTube channel about this. I found most of these shapes online and cut them out of stencil plastic. And they're really helpful for just choosing an area of a design. Let's see, for example, this one. And laying it over to kind of preview and decide which part of it you would like or if you like that shape with it. I've got these kind of funky shaped hearts, which I sort of like. And I think I really like the way that one looks. On that heart, you get some of the darks and the lights. Can I step up maybe one bigger? Hmm. Well, of course, I don't have to follow that shape exactly. I can adapt it a little. I don't have to 
follow it precisely. One of the drawbacks of these self-made templates is that you don't get the hard edge with the acrylic templates that you can run your blade against. So I tend to use them more as a guideline because it's very easy when you're using your blade to cut right into your template and make a mess of your piece. So I don't so much run my blade against it as I just use it as a guide for getting the shape I want. And I'm going to kind of angle in a little bit more here so that my tip comes there. So just a nice sharp craft blade. And when you're cutting, do be sure to keep your blade nice and perpendicular so you get even cuts. And we'll save those pieces. There are definitely things you can do with these pieces. You can freehand or use small cutters and cut shapes. Maybe cut some kind of crescent moon shapes or whatever you want. Now, I'm not 100% thrilled with this heart shape but this is clay, so we can adjust it a bit. What I like to do is just kind of use the blade and just smooth out those corners that weren't quite as nice and round as I would like. I always like my hearts to have a little bit of shape and flair, so here we go. That's kind of cool. I love the glow that comes through there. I just want to indent that a little bit more. Oh, there we go. I like that. Just has a little bit more whimsy, I guess. Now that I'm happy with my heart shape, I'm going to make a background for it. And I have to thank Fiona Abel Smith. I've been watching her videos lately. I skip them for the longest time because her videos tend to be long. It's sometimes up to an hour and I just don't usually take the time to watch videos that long. But I watched one of hers and realized what a fantastic teacher she is and that the hour-long videos go by like that. They're just so wonderful and great teaching. So this is an idea she showed for backing something she made and I just thought it was a terrific way to add a border to a piece that you've done. Here is a bit of the blue clay that was left over with the end of the cane that I used to build my mandala on. I just mixed it up, rolled it out on a number two setting on my pasta machine. I just spritzed it with a little bit of armor all. I have here this wonderful texture sheet by Helen McGuire. I love her texture sheets. They're just wonderful and whimsical. I'm going to choose an area and just roll with my acrylic roller one good roll. There we go. Nice texture. And now I'm not sure what a color I want to use here. I'm going to add a little bit of color. I've got bronze and copper because I thought they would kind of go with the reddish colors in here and I also have some bright green pan pastel. I'm just going to try that. On this one I used a gold, perfect gold, perfect pearls. So I'm just going to lightly, oh, I think that'll look good with the, mmm, with that. Ooh, that's cool. Lightly rub on the texture. And I'm going to do the whole thing because I'm not certain where I'm going to end up placing that heart. If you had a bigger piece and you knew where it was going, you don't have to add your powder to the center that's going to be underneath the pendant. And let's see, I'm going to put this on here and kind of preview. Not that it matters greatly, but well, that's interesting. Just a bunch of different things going on. I'm going to lightly press that in place. 
Now Fiona actually had a really cool way. If you have a straight edge shape that you're trying to make a border for or frame for, she had a really cool way of doing that and I'll let you watch her videos to find it rather than giving away her tricks. But since this is a curved shape, I'm just going to use my craft blade and eyeball probably just under a quarter of an inch. And if you're going to err at all in the evenness of this, err on the side of making it a little too big. Because in the next step I'll show you how we can fix it and make it nice and even all around pretty easily. You want it fairly even to begin with. Uh oh, that got a little skinny there, didn't it? Well, rats. <laughs> That's why I said to err on the side of making it too big. All right, well, let's see. Oh, I like that bright green with the, the dark blue. That looks cool. Well, let's see. Can I, yes, lift this up and reposition it a little and maybe get it better centered. Oh, hooray. Okay, that's a little better. So now you can just take your blade. Sorry about the squeak. Uh, and smooth that out and you can push it in. I've got the dull edge down because this is beveled so there's a bit as small as it might be but th there will be a bit between the bevel and the tile that won't be perfectly straight. So dull edge down just don't forget you have it dull edge down and be careful of your fingers. And let's see what I can do here if it's a little big I can just kind of push that in and adjust it, fix the shape, and of course if you have it straight up and down, um, your edges will be straight up and down. So just keep at it until you're happy with it, and then you can bake it. This is a little more than a quarter of an inch, so I would bake that for 45 minutes. And there you go, mandalas. Of course, you can also leave your mandala whole and do something with that, too. You don't have to cut it up. 